If you notice the, uh, in these sequences that the camera is uh, very close to the ground so that uh, the ceiling becomes more important than the floor and uh, one is shooting kind of up people's nostrils which is quite unusual and this was uh, uh, an approach that David Fincher wanted which I think is terribly effective indeed and makes it more distinctive than the, uh, the, the other tree rather in my opinion. I tried to keep it fairly shadowy so that it looks uh, moody and where I could I, I brought the light from the top because it's unusual for the light to come from the floor but um, one had to be careful about it obviously. The difficulty was getting light into the eyes so that uh, we could see what the, the actors were thinking but um, not at the expense of the mood. David was entirely in control from the very, very beginning. He put his stamp on it. He was the director and nobody ever questioned it, you know. He was uh, completely in control of the set. And everybody kind of hung on his words, you know. He, he was definitely, the, there was no weakness in, uh, in it at all. He was very, very confident in what he was doing and wouldn't be swayed, you know. He, he had this vision and that was what he was going to do. And he came under quite a lot of pressure from 20th Century Fox, you know, to kind of hurry up or do it the quickest way or, the, or the, the most expedient way, but he wouldn't listen. He would do what he wanted to do, quite rightly, in my opinion. As I say, his compositions are marvellous and the use of the frame and so on. David had been a, um, a cinematographer before he became a director, so he knew lighting, he knew what, uh, what was good and what was bad. That's not to take it away from David Werler, the operator, I, he also, I mean, his contribution was enormous as well. Most of the sets had ceilings on because we saw the ceiling so often, so one used to have to hide the light where you could, you know, to the most effect, best effect. Just going in and, in and out of light, with, I put a cucolorus on the, on the uh, lamp so that what a cucolorus is, is is a shape, it's just cut out so, on a piece of wood so that uh, it creates little patches of light that she goes in and out of. Sometimes it doesn't work because the actors are concentrating on what they're saying on the dialogue and they forget that, uh, to, find the, to find the light on their faces. The light coming from the top is a 7K Xenon lamp, which gives you very straight beams, which I thought would be quite a good idea. I shot it up through a mirror because you can't tilt them down at all, otherwise the condenser burns. But we had a mirror above the set and I shined it from the floor onto the mirror. Some people think that uh, it takes longer to light because it's uh, a wide screen and because it's in the scope, the, the lenses are slower than they would be normally with a just an ordinary prime lens. But um, I don't find it that way at all. I think it's, uh, it's uh, I generally shoot at about f4 anyway. A lot of people like to shoot wide open, but I don't. I like the depth of focus that one gets at four, five, six. And uh, I don't like to see two shots where one person is sharp and the other one is uh, blunt, you know. But uh, I've never found it a problem to light to the cinemascope uh, demands. I actually found a, a, uh, a fitting which they use in, in, uh, in operating theatres for surgery and so on. I could never get it in the picture, unfortunately, because they played it against the wall, you know. I think when we cut wide at it, we see it. Whenever that, there you go, there's the, white, there's the old lamp. It's the raison d'etre of the light, that's where the light's coming from, so that's, you'd like to see it a bit more, you know. It's, uh, it's always a thing that we're fighting as cameramen, that um, we have a light source, and, and uh, when you find the film's edited, that the, you never see where the light is coming from. I did a whole sequence on a picture with firelight, and we never saw the fire. I think that by this time I'd said, why can't we see the lamp, guys? And I think we, we pulled it into the shot. It had a sort of curious uh, bluey-green feel to it, which I, I uh, kind of re-echoed in, in the close shots. And there's the, the pit, um, the molten lead pit. I had something like uh, a thousand amps under a large piece of tracing paper, and uh, 
I don't know how many how many small units were under there, but it's almost a thousand amps shining under that thing just to try and make it look really, really hot and also to give the, the effect of the light on the face is that that's where the light is coming from, from that, uh, from that boiling lead. The commissary or the canteen, whichever you like to call it, uh, is one of the lighter places in, in this uh, prison complex because it's lit from the top. And I purposely tried to keep the fluorescent lights above different colours, I mixed the tubes so that uh, it looked uh, more run down, sort of less maintained, you know, so that uh, they, you know, they just put in any kind of tube that they had handy. I think the use of the frame is marvellous, you know, with these close-ups and uh, the composition is terrific, I think. And this is mainly, well, entirely due to David Fincher. He would position the camera meticulously on each shot. I think this uh, moving fan was a great idea on, on Norman Reynolds's part. A marvellous effect with the fan light sort of fan shapes going round. It's, uh, it helps to set the mood and, and, uh, and because it's moving it gives excitement and so on. Actually the colour of the sets helped what I was trying to do because there was kind of uh, grey which means that you can't... Uh, white walls are terrible because they kind of sing back at you, but this great help. I could get odd light onto it, and yet it wouldn't blow back on me. It's difficult with these magnesium flares. Obviously, they're so hot that when you pan onto them, they give you a, a reflective ring. But, um, in fact, I didn't mind the effect. I thought it was quite good. It doesn't like the actors, of course, but it's effective to see it. In fact, uh, lens flare is a mistake, really, but it's in the manufacture of, because the lens is made up of different sections of glass, you know, some convex, some concave, and uh, often when you get the, the uh, bright light on the edge of frame, it reflects back through the elements of the lens and creates that uh, kind of ring effect. You sometimes see it when people pen uh, on exteriors with sunshine, you see it when they pan across the sun you get the, the same effect uh, back in the lens. Generally speaking it, I find it um, unpleasing but uh, in certain circumstances it can work for you as in this case I think it's quite acceptable that uh, we see these flares as the light source moves and of course the ring moves because the reflection comes back through different parts of the elements but, um, but I think it's acceptable on, on, in this case and in fact enhances the image. Normally speaking, on the exteriors, I would uh, do everything to obviate that. I was quite pleased with this, uh, this practical lamp, um, which is creating the source of light on Sigourney's face, as you can see by the moving shadow on her forehead created by the practical lamp. Uh, why I say that I'm pleased with it, because normally uh, you would like to photograph a scene with the actual lamp itself, but the source becomes so bright that it flares out the, uh, the lens and, uh, and doesn't give you the effect required. So you have to augment it with another kind of lamp. But you really get the feeling that uh, she's lit by this lamp. And uh, the separation between the, uh, the shadow side of her head is created by just lighting a little bit on the, on the wall behind her so that you see the shape of the head. I think it's quite an effective shot. And quite often, not on this particular picture, but uh, when you have uh, actors with false hair pieces and so on, you, often you can see the join and uh, you have to help it with the lighting by just shading it a little bit or changing the angle of the light so that you can't see, see the net join in the, in the wig, for example. And uh, quite often contact lenses are quite noticeable. If the light's at, a, at an acute angle, you see the edges of the contact lens, so you've got to help that as well. Those little things, you know. You have to keep your eye on the, on the, uh, on the actors all the time because they're not aware of how they look while they're acting and also they, they get so absorbed in playing the part that they forget, you know, quite often their instructions about lighting. I mean, you can only suggest that you can't tell them what to do because uh, you're there to help them, you know. It's part of the uh, the artistry of a, of a cinematographer. If you uh, have a a leading lady who's uh, probably getting on in years, you have to put the light where they'd look uh, their best.
unless of course they're playing a part where they where they have to look bad, but uh, that's so rare. You have to kind of iron out the wrinkles if you can. This is not confined, of course, to female actors, but uh, male actors as well, because they get old in the same way that anybody else does. Outside the window, of course, is a is a, uh, a backing, a painted backing. It's not actually a set, which is quite nice because the the window beyond that you can see is. Um, uh, has got silver paper on it, which we like to make it look as if it's a lit window. No, your bunch confined to the infirmary. Also, uh, you have to balance the practical lamps on the set. You know, if they're too bright, they they uh, they flare back on the lens. So you have to get them to to a spot where they look as if they're lighting something, but they're not actually. Also, you have to know. Uh, how deep the shadows can be and still see some detail in them. I mean, it's nice to have, have deep shadow, but you've still got to be able to see the eyes. And I think the balance here is quite nice. It's, um, it's uh, a nice sort of soft cross-lit thing, but you can still see the other eye and you know what they're thinking. And also, of course, uh, continuity of sequence. You, you sh do each shot uh, separately, but you have to maintain the feel and uh, continuity of light in each different shot. You can't underexpose flame. It, flame's always going to be very bright, you know. But the thing is to get the, the, the surrounding colours uh, to match the, the, the fire, so to speak, you know, to suggest uh, that the light has come from the fire. Because you do have to, to uh, augment it. To, you can't just let, uh, you know, fire out do the job. You have to also, because it's so bright that it just flares out everything. Um, so you have to colour the the, uh, the lamps, you know, make them warmer, make them more orange to, to match the, the firelight. And uh, <clears throat> so the thing is to go for a, a deep exposure, if you can, you know, to... Uh, to bring the, the light levels up so that the, the flame is more orange because if you shoot it wide open, the, uh, the flame is so bright that it just flares out, becomes so white, it doesn't look like, uh, like firelight, you know. So you have to, you have to colour the lamps and, and get a, a good exposure so that uh, you bring the, the level of the flame down to make it uh, look um, natural. When you're setting up a shot and, you, and sometimes you get an accent, somebody racks up and you think, oh, that's great, you know, let's do that. That's a lovely thing about filmmaking is that you, you have the ability to change your mind, you know, and uh, there's certain things that happen, you know, by accident that, uh, that um, are just magic, you know. I always remember uh, Conrad Hall talking about uh, putting a light through a window, you know, and uh, this guy is in, in a room and it's raining outside and it created tears. The shadows of, tear, of the rain dripping looked like tears on the man's face, and it purely by accident. The very warm light at the, at the far end of the set, I had uh, red filters on the lamps to try and suggest heat, because they're trying to induce the, the uh, alien into, the, into that pit so they can destroy it with the molten lead. So I was trying to give the feeling of, uh, of terrific heat in there. This uh, alien point of view was shot with a uh, prime 10 millimeter lens, which is uh, unsqueezed. In other words, it's, uh, it's distorting. And uh, we did it with a Steadicam. The Steadicam operator was running down the corridors to give the sense of speed. And he also did a marvelous thing, which I thought was very clever, that he flipped the camera over whilst he was running which uh, I hadn't even seen before. It was a very effective move. Obviously, I've got uh, uh, flicker boxes working on these lamps uh, to give the effect of, of kind of fire, you know, firelight and of the hot furnace. You can just see it in the background. You see the light fluctuating, just to give an effect. Once again, with, with flicker, it's nice to flicker on, on several sources at the same time, because if you do just on one lamp, it never looks quite right. It, uh, it's either too regular or too irregular. But if you use more than one lamp at a time, it, uh, it, it comes across much better. <laughs>